I'll be giving us God's word by his grace from Psalm 90. This is the word of God, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. It flourishes and is renewed in the evening. It fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath, we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life, of our life are 70, or by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us. For as many years as we have seen evil, let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Thus far, the eternal word of God. You may be seated. The superscript to the psalm, the, the little text that appears above the psalms, says, A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Moses, we know, was the deliverer of Israel some hundreds of years before the majority of the psalms were written. This prayer of Moses is a prayer of lament. It laments the fallen condition of mankind. It laments the grief that men face in this world. It laments the brevity, the sorrow of life in this world. In this psalm, Mo Moses is, is pouring out sorrow to God, and he pours out the grief that he feels as he surveys the misery of fallen mankind in a world infected with sin. And as he pours out his sorrow to the Lord, he prays for God to show compassion to his people. He asks for the wisdom of God and the grace of God as they deal with life in a world infected with sin. And ultimately, Moses finds hope in the steadfast love of God. Precisely when this psalm was written, we don't know, except that it is very old. It is the oldest psalm in the Psalter. Indeed, this psalm is, is probably one of the oldest texts in Scripture. And yet, because we don't know when it was written, and we don't know the occasion for which it was written, this old psalm is timeless, like all other scripture. Lament is appropriate in our day. There is much that we have to lament. We may lament the pain of a failing body. We may la lament the sorrow of a broken relationship. We may lament over the pain of unbelieving friends or family members who perish or who are perishing apart from Christ. We may grieve the choice of believing family members who are uh, profess faith but who are not walking in obedience. We may lament over the sinful choices that we have made that we cannot undo. We grieve over the deteriorating condition of our culture and the opposition our world has to Christ. We grieve over the ways in which we have failed to live out the gospel of Jesus. 
in an especially poignant way. We lament over the effect that sin has had in bringing death and disease into this world. This pandemic of COVID-19 has made it increasingly apparent that this world is ravaged by the effects of man's sin. So it's appropriate for us to study this lament of Moses. Just as Moses brought his lament to the Lord, we can bring our grief to God. We can find hope like Moses found in our gracious God and renew our hope in his steadfast love and mercy even as we experience pain in a fallen world. So that's the introduction to my sermon. We see in this passage Moses structuring his prayer in three parts. In the first part, verses 1 to 6, we see the sorry reality of the fallen condition of mankind. Then Moses looks at the reason for this condition. Psalm 90, verse 7 to 11. And then in the final part, verses 12 to 17, Moses prays for God to show compassion and mercy on his people in that fallen condition. So in verses 1 to 6, Moses laments the fallen condition of people living in a fallen world. And to highlight the reality of man's sorrowful condition in a fallen world, Moses contrasts us in our condition to God in his eternal condition. Look at verse 1. Look how it says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. The first attribute that God uh, the first attribute of God that Moses highlights here is how God has been their dwelling place for all generations. Not just his generation, but all generations. God has been their dwelling place. And, and in a sense, this is a comfort. But also, in a sense, it is a realization that we have no dwelling place in this fallen world. In our fallen state, we lost our dwelling place. Man was created to dwell in the presence of God in Eden. It was to be the dwelling place of man, a place where we dwelt with God in a perfect world, without sin, without death, and without disease. But because of man's, Adam and Eve's, disobedience, God sent them from their dwelling place, and they became West, restless wanderers aimlessly in a fallen world apart from the dwelling place where they could find no safety and no rest. This is the sickness and disease. This is the, the dwelling, uh, the fact that peop, God's people, in fact, fallen people, are removed from the dwelling place that God had intended for them in, in Eden, in the creation. As the children's rhyme says, in Adam's fall, we die all. And Moses realized this. He realized this fallen condition of mankind especially well. Think back over Moses' life. His people were slaves in a foreign land. There was no dwelling place for them in Egypt in that sense. He lived for 40 years as a foreigner in Pharaoh's palace. Then he went and was, was driven into the wilderness in Midian. He, he lived for 40 years wandering with his sheep. Then he returned to Egypt to bring his people out of bondage and, and God delivered them. But they rebelled and they refused to obey God and enter the land of promise. And because of their sinful rebellion and their disobedience, that whole generation that left Egypt could not enter into the promised land that God had prepared for them. And so they all perished. So for these 40 years, they were wandering around with no place that they could call their own. They had no dwelling place. Finally, this rebellious generation had all died and God's people could finally enter the land of promise, but Moses himself could not enter. He died before setting foot in the land of promise. And so Moses realized in this world, in this fallen world, there is no dwelling place. But in verse 1, he fixes his gaze on heaven and he considers that even in this world, there is no dwelling place because of the infection of sin. But God, you are our dwelling place in all generations. He confesses the Lord himself is his dwelling place. The land of Canaan would not ultimately be that place, the place of rest for God's people. 
there remained a greater rest, a, a real rest, that the Lord himself would be the rest for the people of God. True, not only for Moses, but for the patriarchs. Think about Abraham or Isaac or Jacob. Did they receive what God had promised them? God had promised that they would inherit the land of Canaan, that that would be the land that he had promised them, but, but they did not receive it. They wandered around in tents, strangers, pilgrims in this world, because they looked not to an earthly dwelling place, to an earthly home, but as Hebrew says, they looked forward to a heavenly city, to the Lord, who is their dwelling place in all generations. Then the second attribute of God that Moses describes is in verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Imagine Moses wandering around the wilderness of Sinai, surrounded by these ancient mountains. And as he looked up at those ancient hills, those aged peaks were like newborn babies in the presence of an eternal, everlasting to everlasting creator. And, and that's where Moses' mind goes. God is the preexistent, eternal creator because the character of God never changes. He is everlasting to everlasting. He is the preexistent creator, so he is eternal. And he never changes. That's precisely what makes him to be our dwelling place for all generations. In our God, there is no variation or shadow due to change. James 1. Spurgeon said, in this eternal, unchanging one, there is a safe abode for the successive generations of men. Moses' prayer, describing these attributes of God, rings true for all people in all times. Who in this world never changes? Who in this world never fails? What surety do we have in this ever-changing world? God himself is our dwelling place, our security, our safety our stability, and our refuge. Hebrews 13 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our unchanging Lord is our sure foundation. We sang it, Christ, our sure and steady anchor. We are merely pilgrims and strangers in this world, but our hope is uh, not in this world. It is in the one who has been our dwelling place through all generations. Then Moses' prayer turns to a more lamentable tone in verses 3 to 6. He, he shifts his gaze from heaven to the condition of man on earth. And in contrast with the eternality of God, in contrast with the unchanging and eternal character of God, look at verse 3. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. Unlike God, who lives forever, man's life is short. Our creator fashioned us from dust, and at his word, our lives dissolve back to dust. Death makes the lifespan, the lifespan of man very short. Verse 4 continues, For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, or as a watch in the night. A millennium seems like an impossible length of time, if we think back, now is 2020, a thousand years ago, a thousand and twenty. Seems like an impossibly long period of time. But to the Lord, it's so brief. It's like a vague recollection of yesterday. Even Methuselah, who lived 969 years, lived a short life. It was merely a watch in the night, a four-hour span to God. Death makes man's life short. Each year seems to pass quicker than the last. Our gray-headed brothers and sisters know well how, life sh how, how short life is. Compared to the eternality of God, our short life is hardly a blip on the timeline of history. That troubled Moses. And not only is man's life short, but it's also frail and insignificant. Look at 5 and 6. You sweep them away as with a flood, they are like a dream, like grass that's renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. Just as the floodwaters sweep down and wash everything away in their path, so the Lord sweeps away successive generations of mankind. We come, 
and then we are swept away and are gone. Fallen man is so frail, so transitory, so short-lived. Moses says that we are as insignificant and unsubstantial as a dream. Just as we wake up and the dream evaporates, so man's life in this fallen world amounts, amounts to nothing. Moreover, Moses says that we are like grass. In the morning, we are youthful and strong and vigorous. By the evening, we fade and are withered. Even if we try to water the grass and fertilize the grass, eating good food and dieting and getting plenty of sleep, we, we cannot f prolong the flowery greenness for very long. Soon we will wither and die. This is the reality of our condition in a fallen world. Life is frail. Time is short. Death is is sure. Moses knew that as well as anybody. He was very familiar with the agony of death. Think about what the, the, the environment Moses and, and the people of Israel were in. They had left Egypt. How much death had they seen as the plagues ravaged that country? How much death had they seen when they witnessed the Red Sea sweep away the armies of Egypt. How much death did they witness as an entire generation of people perished in the wilderness because of their rebellion against God as they wandered around for 40 years? In Numbers 14, the Lord promised every person who had been delivered from Egypt, every, everybody over fighting age would perish in the wilderness. And the Bible tells us how many fighting people there were. 600,000 fighting men. In addition to fighting men, there are their priests. They weren't counted. And there's men, uh, women and there's children or, or those over fighting age. So the, the women, the elderly, I, I'm sorry, not to mention the children, the women, the elderly, and the priests, plus the 600,000 fighting men, likely amounted to more than 2 million people. And those 2 million people perished in 40 years. That's 136 funerals every day, a person every 10 minutes until Caleb and Joshua remained. So Moses' prayer, it's not hyperbole. Indeed, in this fallen world, life is short and life is frail. Moses correctly captures the reality of fallen man's condition in this world. We are frail and life is as significant as a dream. No sooner do we begin than we end in death. And this is something that we often forget or ignore as much as we can. But perhaps now in this, uh, uh, with the pandemic, COVID-19 uh, spreading over the world, it helps us to realize something that we should never forget, that our life is frail. It's as frail as it truly is. Just a simple virus can lay low thousands of people. Um, and that's not just for people in other places, but it's for us as well. Do you realize how frail your life is? Do you realize that you are always being sustained by the providence and care of God? The scripture says that we have no confidence in the flesh. Think about all the Psalms where it says, don't rely on the arm of flesh. Don't rely on anything in this world, ultimately. Not in our worldly position, not in our wealth, not in our government, not in our medical system, not any of these things. In our fallen condition, life is a vapor. But even like Moses, in the face of man's frailty, there is a hope as we look to the unchanging and steadfast character of our loving God who never changes. Now, at this point, you might think this is kind of a depressing sermon. But don't, don't worry. As we get to the end, we will see the hope that Moses has is the same hope that we have. But before we get there, let's look at the reason for such a dire condition of mankind in this fallen world. And that's what Moses looks at in verses 7 to 11. So having described the sad reality of fallen mankind, Moses explains why life is like this. Verse 7, for we are brought to an end by your anger, by your wrath, we are dismayed. The fallen world is the way that it is, not because of, well, que sera, sera, that's just the way things are. No, no. It is because we, as a sinful human world, is under the wrath and anger of God. The shortness of life, the pain that fills it, our insignificant and unsubstantial condition, ultimately, are consequences of man's sin. 
Sin began with Adam and continues to us. Ephesians 2, 3 says that we are by nature children of wrath, that God's wrath and anger are kindled against us because of our sin and disobedience against him. And when I say that against us, I mean human beings, sinful humanity. God's people have a different statement said about them. We'll get there soon. When Adam sinned, death entered the world. Just as the Lord promised, you shall surely die. Gen Genesis chapter 2. And then verse 8, and Moses continues, You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Nothing is hidden from God. God will bring every deed into judgment, every secret thing, whether good or evil. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, 14. Then Moses continues in verses 9 and 10. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Some aspects of God's judgment are still to come. Other aspects have already been poured out. God created human beings in his eternal image. God did not make Adam to die, but to live forever in the image of God. But sin has brought death and decay into our mortal bodies. God created human beings to be noble, exalted servants over all of creation, but sin has brought a curse to the ground. As a result, not only is our life short, but it is hard. Even those who live long, 80, 90, 100 years, have lives filled with toil and trouble, and when it is over, they fly away to the grave. Yesterday, I had a video conference with my ailing grandmother. She's 91. She's living in the care home in West Kelowna. Um, my mom was there visiting her in person, but because of the visitor restrictions and a few other things, none of the rest of the family could be there. So she used her phone, and we had a Skype call to talk with my grandma. And my kids and I said, you know, we love you, Grandma. I reminded her of her hope in the gospel. She's a Christian. We sang some verses of hymns, and then we said goodbye. And my mom suggested, Grandma, you want to pray for Joshua and for their kids? And because of her dementia, she sadly said, but I don't know who they are. And that's the way this life is in this fallen world. Consider how our days pass under the wrath of God. They are soon gone and we fly away. The consequence of sin. Moses summarized ultimately the reason for man's fallen condition. Verse 11. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? This is the problem. Fallen men have become ignorant of God. They no longer think about the power of God the anger of God. They no longer think about the wrath of God or fear God. The fool in his heart says there is no God. The Lord has given them over to a reprobate mind, to seared consciences, so they remember him no more. Moses had witnessed that. If we think back, Exodus chapter 5, when Moses said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. That was what Pharaoh said. And, and not only Pharaoh says that, but everyone, apart from the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, has a heart dead to God. Fallen people do not consider the reality of God's wrath against them. They underestimate the God's holiness. They overestimate their goodness they underestimate their sinfulness, excusing themselves, justifying themselves, and denying and overlooking the wrath of God against sin. My brothers and sisters, that is not something that we should do. We should never forget the wrath and anger of our mighty and righteous God against sin. Even us who have a hope in the gospel should recognize that the punishment that was placed on Christ was God's wrath and anger poured out on sin in our place. And may we remember God according to the fear of him.
verse 3, I mean part 3. Is there a remedy for this fallen condition? Verses 12 to 17. Moses described the condition of fallen man in 1 to 6. He explains why it's there. Verses 7 to 11. And, and now Moses makes his request to God in light of this fallen condition of mankind. In light of the fact that man has forgotten God and, and in his reprobate mind, God has given them over to a fallen world. In, in light of these harsh realities, life is short, death is sure. What does Moses pray for? He brings one general request and then a whole bunch of specific requests. Let's look at the general request. Verse 12, teach us to number our days. In the shortness of man's life, Moses asked the Lord, teach us to number our days. How to spend life. If life is short, we need to spend it well. What counts is what happens in this life. And then what happens after death is determined by how we live on earth. Not in the sense of the works that we have done, but the response that we make to God. So Charles Spurgeon said, a short life should be wisely spent. And he's right. The world tempts us to ignore the reality of this transitory life, tempts us to live for pleasure, tempts us to live for the moment. Young people especially, do not be tempted that life is short, I can honor God when I'm older. Moses prays to the Lord, teach us to number our days. We need this prayer. We need the wisdom of God in how we spend our brief time on earth. Then Moses asks God for five specific things. And these are things to remedy man's sorrowful condition. First, he asks for wisdom. The end of verse 12, that we may get a heart of wisdom. We need a heart of wisdom. Fallen condition of man cannot be solved with human wisdom. We can't solve or address the ills of this world that come from sin using psychology, using education, using the government, using medicine, none of those things will ultimately solve what perils this world because it is the peril of sin. And it requires the wisdom of God. God's wisdom, not just um, with regards to those practical problems, but God's wisdom to know how to really spend a life, how to spend a life such that God is glorified such that we may uh, we cannot remedy our own condition by ourselves or with our own abilities but we can only function according to the wisdom of God that he has provided for us in his word and in the gospel so Moses asks for wisdom then then the next thing Moses pray, Moses prays for is for mercy verse 13 return O Lord how long have pity on your servants Moses is really asking God, please return to your people. Show compassion on us. Show us mercy. We don't deserve anything from God, but we are suffering in this world apart from, um, we are suffering in this world because of the perils of sin. So please show us mercy. We are frail. We are dismayed under your wrath, but we know that you are a merciful God. Please show us mercy. Then Moses prays for God's steadfast love. Verse 14, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Moses acknowledges that satisfaction is not anywhere, but only in God. Satisfy us with your steadfast love. Moses looks to the loving covenant of God, the steadfast faithfulness of God, even as a whole generation is wasting away before him, Moses knows that the steadfast love of God is a source of satisfaction and hope in a world filled with death. How about you? Is your eye on anything in this life for satisfaction? Or are you looking to the steadfast love of God that can make us rejoice and be glad even in a fallen world. Then verse 4, Moses prays for God to do a work to bring us joy. Verse 15, make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen evil. How can we who live in a fallen world ever be glad? 
it cannot be accomplished by man's work or man's power. You know, like if, if I were to stop this sermon here, it would be very morose. How can we rejoice when we're facing this kind of situation? It requires God's power. So Moses prays, verse 16, let your work be shown to your servants, your glorious power to their children. It is not by our power or our actions or our work that we can make a good situation out of a bad one. But it is by God's power. God must do the work to bring joy in a world afflicted by sin. We see many pains. We see many pains and sorrows in this world. And we are powerless to do anything about it. We need a God who can do a work to bring joy in the midst of sin. And that's what Moses is praying for. And then lastly, in verse 17, we need God's grace and favor. Verse 17, let the favor of our Lord be upon us. Establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. In the midst of the fallen man's insignificance and transitory nature, Moses asked for God's favor to be upon his people. Moses asked, even though we are weak and even though we are transitory and our life is like a vapor and our days are so short, even still, O oh Lord, be, show your favor to us. In your grace, help us to do something that may be established and significant for you. And this is only by the grace of God. He asks that by the grace of God, God may make our lives mean something in the scope of eternity. So in summary, what, what is this prayer of Moses? If, if we were to step back, what is Moses praying? Moses is, is praying this prayer of lament as a God-centered confession that in light of our fallen condition, our greatest need is for God himself. We need wisdom from God, how we can spend our life. We need mercy from God be because we are sinners. We need his steadfast love. We need the Lord to work in our fallen condition to bring us joy. We need his grace. How did God answer this prayer? Let's turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 9. Let's see how God in his marvelous wisdom and grace answered the prayer of Moses. Chapter uh, Romans 5, verse 6. For while we were weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. God has directly answered the prayer of Moses. Can you see it? Through the work of Jesus Christ in the gospel. Who is our wisdom? Christ is the wisdom of God. He is the word incarnate. How can we receive mercy? While we were still weak sinners, Christ took the penalty of sin upon himself to give us mercy. How have we received the love of God? God has shown his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. What brings us joy? It is the work of regeneration. We were dead, enemies of God, imperiled by sin. But God has made us alive to be reconciled to God by the death of his son. And how has God shown us grace? Having been reconciled by the Christ's death, 
and justified by his blood, we are saved from God's wrath. Rather than children of wrath, we are children of God's grace and favor. How has God established the works of our hands? That's what Moses prayed. Establish the works of our hands. Through Christ's resurrection from the dead, death is defeated. We are delivered out of the curse of death, out of the power of death, and out of fear. So death no longer has victory. Even the grief and the trouble that we face in this life is winning for us an eternal weight of glory. It says in, in 2 Corinthians 4, light momentary afflictions are preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comprehension. So the gospel has transformed the meaninglessness and the insignificance of this world, of a life that is short to a life that is full of depth and meaning and purpose. Ephesians 2.10, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are promised a crown that will last, an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade away. Our life is short, yes, in this world, fallen by sin. But what we do in this life for God is laid up as an eternal treasure in heaven. In the gospel, God miraculously transformed a brief life into one that is instrumental in building up the kingdom of God and the church of God, which will last forever. We can be used by God in saving man's eternal souls. Everything in this world will fall away. The only thing that will remain is the church and the eternal souls of God's people. Excuse me, the eternal souls of all creation, all created people. God's people will exist forever in the paradise of God. And the enemies of God will exist forever under the wrath of God, separated, by the, separated from the presence of Christ. God has answered Moses' prayer of lament in the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ. The, Moses' prayer of lament is a reflection on our need for God. And the gospel is the response and how God has satisfied that need. The world around us is grappling with the reality of the fallenness of this sinful world in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic. Some are um, unnecessarily afraid. Others are uh, not afraid, uh, not as, as concerned as, as perhaps they ought to be. But no one is concerned, I, I would wager, no one is as concerned as they ought to be regarding the peril of their souls. The peril of their souls. Death for the unrepentant person is uh, followed by the second death in the lake of burning sulfur, where the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever and they have no rest day or night. Revelation 14, 11. So my dear brother and sister in Christ, this prayer of Moses gives us hope in the gospel. My friend who has not put faith and hope in Christ, this prayer highlights the fallen condition of this world, imperiled by sin, and it calls you to solemnly reflect as a sinful person living in a sinful world, what hope do you have apart from Christ. Trust in Christ for your salvation. Number your days wisely. We do not know when our life will be required of us. So may you put your hope and trust in Christ. The Bible says, anyone who comes to him, he will not drive away. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness, to give your stony heart into a heart of flesh, so that you may have, rather than a dead hope in this world, periled by sin, a living hope in heaven forever and a life of eternal significance for God and for his kingdom. Oh, my brothers and sisters, God is our dwelling place in all generations. He is our fortress and strength. He is an ever-present help in time of trouble. He sustains us with his divine power. He rules over this world. And in the gospel, his love and mercy and love and 
His love and mercy and grace have been so wondrously shown to us, redeeming all who hope in Christ from the sad reality of a fallen world and given us a glorious hope in his glorious kingdom where we will never experience suffering or disease or pain. The scripture says he will wipe every tear from his people's eyes. Even as we face grief and trials and sickness in this life, through them we can taste the steadfast love of God. By them we are renewed in his grace, renewed in our need for him. And because of them, we look forward to our eternal heavenly reward. Like Moses, may God help us to pray to number our days aright, to act wisely in the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, that we may spend our brief years to know Christ better, to shine forth his glory, and to serve and build up his church in our generation. May God help us to do this by his grace. Let's pray. Lord, when we consider this world and the sufferings that we face, like Moses, we see that there is no hope for us in this world, in ourselves, in our institutions, in man-made religion. There is no hope. You alone, O God, are our hope. Thank you that you have made a way for us to be delivered from the domain of darkness by the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb without sin who was sacrificed on behalf of the sins of your people. Lord, thank you that our sin, those who believe in our Lord, who have put their faith in him, who have emptied themselves of all of their own self-help or self-dependence, but have wholly trusted in Christ, turning away from sin. Thank you that you have given us forgiveness, restoration, regeneration, and a new hope in, in, in you. Oh Lord, may we remind ourselves today and every day that our life is in your hand, that this world is brief, it is passing away, but your kingdom is forever. May we have wisdom, Lord, to number our days, to gain a heart of wisdom, that we may live for your glory and for your kingdom. Oh God, as this world grapples with something the scripture tells us so clearly, that we are sinners against the holy God and this world is infected by sin, may many look to the scripture. May many consider the gospel of Jesus Christ. And may you help us to share the hope that we have in him, the grace that you have given us in him. Establish the work of our hands for the glory of your name, for the praise of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in his glorious name. Amen.